Welcome to our online lecture on computer software. In this video, we'll consider the software that makes a computer perform. Here you see an abstract view of a computer system. At the foundation of this pyramid, we see hardware. Hardware consists of all of the physical components of the computer, including the processor and memory mounted on a motherboard, and all of the devices that connect those elements. While those physical pieces are a very important part of the system, alone they're fairly useless. This collection of metal and plastic needs software to make it useful. The software that actually manages all of this equipment is called system software. You might say that system software serves the hardware directly while application software serves the user. The system software serves as a link between the users and the hardware. Application, on the other hand, serves user needs. It is your word processor, your spreadsheet, your payroll application, your games, and much, much more. One might compare the two categories of software by the terminology that is used. With system software, we're using a lot of technical terms such as bits and bytes and RAM and ROM. With the application software, the terminology is terminology of the application. If we're in a word processing program, we use terms like boldfacing, underlining, and so on. If we're operating a spreadsheet, the terms are cells, formulas, and functions. As a user, most of us don't think we should even have to know that system terminology in order to use a computer. And we're actually correct. Nevertheless, it is helpful to any user to know how this system actually works. A few years ago, I added the communication infrastructure to the pyramid because in this day and age, an honest evaluation of computing suggests that without access to the internet, a computer is just not very useful. So much of what we do now involves the use of provider networks and the internet. Today, we are accessing data and programs on remote computers even in other countries. Now we're even storing our own data in the cloud with services like Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, iDrive. Above communication, you'll find policies and procedures. You can have the best computer ever built with the finest software available, but if you do not implement reasonable policies and procedures, your fine equipment may let you down in a major way. For example, if you do not have a policy that requires you to back up your data on a regular schedule, you are guaranteed someday to pay dearly. As reliable as most computers are, they are still subject to failure. Technology, including computers, has traditionally become cheaper and cheaper over time. A computer that may only cost a few thousand dollars may easily have information worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to the organization. Those of us who lived along the southern United States Gulf Coast are well aware of the devastation that a hurricane can bring. What would concern the organization most as the wind sends the computer center flying away? Lost hardware that cost a few thousand dollars? Or the accounts receivable data on it that might be worth millions? These policies and procedures are critical. Remember as well that we live in the age of the Internet. The conveniences and the benefits this wonderful information highway delivers can be tempered by the bad guys out there who are trying to find a way into your data. If you don't have policies in place controlling how the network can be used, your system is a victim in waiting. Finally, at the peak of our pyramid, we find the user. At the risk of offending, this is where most of the problems with computers lie. Untrained users careless users, programmers who do not test their software sufficiently, and others all present the biggest risk to computer systems. Perhaps we should be aware that most failures of systems come from within our own user population. Even if we're discussing malicious software that has come into our system to do damage, the responsibility often comes down to a promiscuous user who did not implement proper internet security. Promiscuous is used here to describe a user who does not take care in selecting the sites he goes to or the software that he uses. As we proceed in this video, we'll be discussing the software layers of our pyramid in more detail. 
We'll start with system software. Just as the name implies, system software is software used to create and manage and use the computer system. Here are the three most important categories of system software. The operating system, translators, and utilities. Let's talk about these examples from left to right beginning with the operating system. The operating system is usually described as the resource manager of the computer. In the earliest days of computing, there weren't even programming languages, so in order to program a computer, it was necessary to manually reconfigure the switches and possibly even rewire the things. Then in the mid-1950s, the first programming languages came along, making it much easier to change the function of the computer. However, even then, it was necessary for the programmer to write code to do all the housekeeping, shall we say, of moving data around in memory, setting up the storage, and so on. So rather than having a programmer concentrating on writing the code for a payroll program as an example, he or she had to spend more time moving things around in memory than trying to figure out how to make the best payroll program. Since the introduction of the first operating system in the early 1960s, the programmer can now concentrate on the requirements of the program being written and simply have his program ask the operating system to handle that data movement chore. Since this video discusses the microcomputer, we'll limit our discussion to operating systems found on those machines today. When the first micros were introduced, general purpose operating system software for that category of computer was scarce. So the new manufacturers created their own proprietary operating systems for these pioneering machines. Apple introduced the Apple II. With it, Apple DOS. Radio Shack introduced the TRS-80 and TRIS-DOS or TRS-DOS. Those are two prominent examples of proprietary operating systems. There was one popular general purpose operating system at that time that was used by a large number of computers, CPM, which stood for Control Program Microcomputers. At the time, CPM was considered more of a business-oriented operating system. One could even buy CPM for the Apple II or the TRS-80. When IBM was first developing their new IBM PC machine, they made the decision that they did not want to create their own operating system. So they started looking for a supplier. They already had a contract with a third party vendor to create a basic interpreter for their new computer. That company was Microsoft, led by Bill Gates and Paul Allen. As the story goes, the IBM engineers inquired if Microsoft had an operating system and Gates told them that they did not and suggested that they contact the developer of CPM, Digital Research. When negotiations with Digital Research failed, they went back to Gates and this time he told them that Microsoft would create an operating system for the new IBM PC. What Microsoft actually did was buy one from the Seattle Computer Company and then modify it for the IBM PC. When it comes to Microsoft's success, the rest is history. That operating system became PC-DOS and MS-DOS. The timeline for this is about 1980. MS-DOS evolved through several generations into what we know of today as Windows 8. A major part of any operating system is the user interface. All of these early versions that we've been talking about were, were text-based user interfaces, meaning that one had to input text commands from the keyboard. In other words, the user interface was called a command line interface. And the learning curve was steep. Although we can still use the command line for most modern operating systems, we are more familiar with the graphical user interface, GUI, that allows us to simply point and click to make our way through all of the operating system commands. Why don't we take a break here? Go ahead and look over your questions to see if you caught the answers for the system software that we've talked about so far. And when you're ready, come on back and we'll continue.